Growing up in northern Colorado, each passing year saw wildfire become an increasingly frightening specter hanging over the front range. Summer fire seasons turned into year-round threats, with one of the largest fires in Colorado history occurring in January, complete with snow on the ground. No matter how many catastrophic burns turned bluebird days into an uncanny orange landscape, the increasing regularity did nothing to lessen the fear. When I moved to Chicago, I thought I'd left my past with fire far behind me in the rearview mirror. In the usual retelling of the history of Chicago, fire makes one infamous appearance in the events that have woven the fabric of the city together as she stands today. But if we dig through the layers of the city, past the Great Chicago Fire, past the fortification of native swamplands, past the settlement of the city by Du Sable and European colonizers, a deeper, hidden relationship with fire is uncovered in the earth. This city, built on prairie, wetland, savanna, longs to burn. But I had no idea when I started to uncover the layers of dirt on the story, how much conflict and tension was right beneath the surface. How much of a battle it's been to bring fire and other stewardship practices back to the landscape during the establishment of the forest preserves, and even today. When we think of fire as a culture, we may picture these catastrophic burns that I experienced growing up in western forests, but grasslands actually have some of the highest fire frequencies on earth, even in wetland areas, bogs, and marshes that have their own vital relationships with fire. Culture-wide conversations about carbon sinks largely focus on forests and trees, but prairies and savannas cover between 20 to 40 percent of the Earth's surface, also working hard to sequester carbon. In fact, fire-adapted grasses can have root systems that extend 6 to 20 feet into the soil. Thus, carbon is stored deep in the ground where it won't be released when burnt, as might happen with a tree in the forest. Walking around the preserved land of Cook County, tickled by the towering turkey foot grass, taking refuge in the sun under the shade of the oaks that pepper the savannas, with wild bergamot flowers that thrive in the leafy shadows. It's easy to forget that you're in the second most populated county in the United States. The district actually protects 70,000 acres of land today, which puts it in running with the size of many of the country's popular national and state parks in regards to size. The Cook County Forest Preserves are also one of the oldest districts of their kind in the country. They were established and came of age alongside some of the United States' other national conservation efforts like the U.S. Forest Service and the Park Service. Still, Illinois, known today as the Prairie State, is actually only home to 1 100th percent of its original 21 million acres of old growth prairie, according to the USDA. I connected with Dr. Todd Aschenbach. He's a PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology and a professor at Grand Valley State University, specializing in prairie restoration and disturbance ecology. I wanted to know what happened to the Midwest's most abundant ecosystem. There's certainly several things that, that happened. Uh, first off, much of them, of course, were plowed under uh, in order to use that rich prairie soil to, to grow agricultural crops. Uh, so it, it's kind of a victim of its own uh, richness, if you will. Uh, and then following that, a, a history of fire suppression really took its toll on, on any remaining prairies. Uh, Smokey Bear said wildfire is bad, which, yes, wildfire can be extremely destructive. Uh, unfortunately, Smokey Bear's message was, was taken as all fire is bad. And this mentality that all fire is bad prevented fire from being used as a necessary management tool in prairies, resulting in the invasion of trees and shrubs taking over those particular areas. And in a sense, if you don't have fire, you don't have prairie. And uh, so we really suppressed fire um, at every at every turn, and, and that allowed these prairies to turn into something else, basically. The ecosystem became a victim of its own fertility. White settlers rushed to plow the region's native biodiversity and sow cash crops in the rich Midwestern soils. And without the influence of fire, shrubs and trees quickly usurped the remnants of prairie land that was not claimed for agriculture. And the prairies, with their rich soils and diverse ecosystems, were largely relegated to a one-inch strip along the highway fence line where mowers and plows couldn't reach. As settlers expanded westward from the East Coast into the Midwest to establish these agricultural communities, they regularly remarked on the untouched majesty, beauty, and fertility of the region. 
But what they couldn't understand is that the richness of the soil was no coincidence or happenstance, but the product of generations of diligent prescriptive burn and land management work by the indigenous peoples of the region. They believed that fire was purely destructive, and they worked diligently to separate these grasslands from the fires that they evolved with, as well as the people who set them. Over a century's worth of development later, it may surprise folks, even those that live in the Chicagoland area, infamous for its urban and industrial landscapes, rife with environmental justice issues, that some of the best remnants of Illinois' last one one-hundredth of a percent fall within the bounds of Cook County. In fact, world-renowned plant biologist, former president of the Field Museum, and bona fide British person, Sir Peter Crane, once spoke of the Cook County Forest Preserves, saying that the remnants were, quote, home to the greatest concentration of endangered plant communities in Illinois. There are more native plants in our six-county area than all the whole of the British Isles, unquote. But in the same breath, Crane admitted that the impacts of development and fire suppression had pushed these remnants to the brink, adding that, quote, the natural processes that sustain local ecosystems no longer work, unquote. These remnant areas need stewardship. And that's where the Cook County Forest Preserves come in. Chicago was expanded rapidly after the Great Fire of 1871. Like a wildfire clearing a forest floor for a second succession of seedlings to grow, this tragedy wiped the slate clean and allowed for the creation of a new kind of industrial city. Built with new ideas, materials, and processes brought on by a technical revolution. The remaining natural history and landscapes of the area, miraculously spared from the first enclave of agricultural development, could have been easily paved over if not for the foresight of Chicago architect Dwight Perkins, who had come of age in a working-class neighborhood on the south side of the city. His daughter, Eleanor Ellis Perkins, remembers her father and his appreciation for the natural world in a biography of his life entitled Perkins of Chicago. As a teenager working in the stockyards, Perkins sought refuge from the environmental blight of an industrializing Chicago by exploring the remaining marshes, wetlands, and prairies of the region. Quote, as a man later on, he was able to formulate his conviction that human beings do not remain fully human if they are entirely cut off from the beauty of the natural world, Eleanor recalls. Dr. Natalie Bump Vina, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Urban Studies at Queens College, is an expert in environmental policy making and the history of the Cook County Forest Preserves. She helped me understand Perkins' inspiration that would push him through the challenge of establishing this outer belt preserve system. His practice was really influenced by, I think, what we would call now a social justice framework because he really wanted to create environments where poor working class Chicagoans could really thrive. His interest in creating the forest preserves was really about giving working class and poor Chicagoans the opportunity to have vacation experiences in nature. As Perkins began to establish his professional reputation, America was being gripped by a growing panic amongst the general populace about the loss of natural beauty after over a hundred years of helter-skelter exploitation of resources from sea to shining sea. In 1903, the same year that the Forest Service was established on a national level, Perkins and a landscape architect named Jens Jensen laid out a plan for a band of preserves in the Chicago area that would protect a variety of landscapes, everything from bogs to marshes to prairies to woodlands. There was an understanding that Chicago had fewer um, parks per capita or fewer park acres for, per capita compared to other cities like Boston and was really, you know, behind. And um, they commissioned Perkins, who then got Jensen involved, um, to draft this report on recommendations for expanding the regional park system. But from the beginning, the Outer Belt Park Plan differed in key ways from other urban parks contemporary to the period. Eleanor writes of the plan saying, quote, because the plan was right and did not compromise for the sake of expediency, it had power, unquote. No room for compromise. Little did the two know, but the plan would bring on a 15-year legal battle that would raise questions that the preserves are still struggling with to this day. What kinds of nature are worth protecting? How should we protect them? 
And would the region subscribe to the idea of letting nature run its course and leaving areas untouched? Or would it reintroduce stewardship tactics to restore the native ecosystems? The initial bill written to establish what was referred to as the forest preserves was nearly night and day from the plan proposed by Perkins and Jensen. The bill set aside funding for the creation of manicured parks with a focus on heavily wooded areas rather than natural preserves, and the two original authors of the plan had a choice. Compromise their vision in the sake of expediency, or fight, and risk the future of the establishment of these remnant areas as preserves. Perkins and Jensen chose to sabotage the bill. In the following years, Perkins took important policymakers on tours of not only the woodlands, which would have been widely accepted as cultural symbols of natural beauty, but also the landscapes that he considered to be underappreciated. The marshlands, the prairies, and the bogs that defined his youth and the development of his ethos. These efforts succeeded in 1909 with a new bill that was introduced that outlined the establishment of a system more in line with the original plan that Jensen and Perkins had originally intended. But shortly after the passage of the bill, it ended up in court where it was declared unconstitutional. The Preserve District essentially aimed to create a new governing body in the county, and the decision came down to issues regarding the appointment of officials, dual protection clause, and double taxation but I don't want to get too far into the weeds. There is one huge consequence of this court case that stewards in the cities are still repairing the damage of to this day. Dicta is non-binding language. It's sort of like an aside. Like, by the way, we also don't like this. (laughs) And so um, in Dicta, they said, well, it's really weird that this is called a forest preserve district. But when you're describing the purpose of the district, you're saying that... um, you know, its leaders could acquire all different kinds of landscapes. Mm -hmm. The purpose clause to generally protect the flora and fauna of Cook County and the name forest preserves were at odds with one another. As the purpose clause left room for something other than a forest to be potentially included in conservation efforts. Land prices were rising and the fragility of these remnants loomed over their heads like a ticking time bomb. Desperation to pass the bill before protecting any land exited the realm of possibility. The language of the legislation was rewritten to specifically outline the protection of forests, despite Perkins's concern that this would compromise the ability of the county to acquire and conserve other landscapes that he had fought so hard to include. If Jensen and Perkins' original plan was to acquire lots of different kinds of ecosystems, Why did they end up compromising and changing the purpose clause versus just changing the name of the preserve district? Do we know? Um, No, I think that's a really great question. I do think, um, remember this, the forest preserve district, in order for it to, um, in order for it to be established, the legislature had to, you know, pass the act in both houses, the governor had to sign it. And then also the Cook County public had to vote to ratify it. And one of the things that we just talked about was that forests really were viewed as the epitome, kind of the height of nature. And at this time, for a variety of reasons. So we see the Chicago Parks District improving its parks by planting forests, like vacation areas are described as forested wilderness. So I think they were also concerned about appealing to public sentiment as well, um, because again, they had to get the people of Cook County to ratify this district as well. They wanted people to be excited about it. And I think that they believed that people in Cook County would be most excited about a district protecting forests. But after 15 years of fighting over policy and planning and wording, the preserves were finally established and began to acquire land and begin efforts. But it didn't take long for Perkins' worst fears to be realized. Owners of marshland and prairie areas such as Skokie Marsh were able to successfully block the purchase of their private areas by the Forest Preserve District, citing that purpose clause. Even after the language was written in the early 30s, this cultural equation of wooded land with nature deftly guided conservation efforts moving forward. 
the county continued to favor the acquisition of wooded land over prairie and grassland, and even went so far as to mow down grasses on treeless old-growth prairies and savannas, and plant single-generation monocultural forests to establish the aura of a mm, wild refuge for local residents, while simultaneously and ironically destroying actual grassland refuge. According to a report by WBZ, over 100,000 trees were planted in the year 1930 alone. By the 1970s, the future of the grassland ecosystems in Chicago looked bleak. But a radical and charismatic organizer whose political career had stalled out after the end of the Vietnam War movement was looking for an outlet for his skills and energy. This podcast was researched and created by me, Lou Bean, with original music by Chicago musician Hauntis. Thank you to Dr. Todd Aschenbach and Dr. Natalie Bump Vienna for lending their time and expertise. Information for this episode was accessed through WBEZ Reporting, the Cook County Forest Preserve Archives, and Eleanor Ellis Perkins' biography of her late father, Perkins of Chicago. Thanks for listening.